America runs on corruption. That's the view of an American expert on collusion, crime, and corruption who spent 10 years working in Afghanistan. She worked amid Taliban attacks, politically connected drug lords, and rampant thievery by government officials. But she says that in many ways, America is far worse than war-torn Afghanistan. Welcome to Crime Waves. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Crime Waves. My name is Declan Hill, and I'm an associate professor of investigations here at the University of New Haven. And each week, myself and my students, and for this episode, it is the brilliant Caitlin DeLuc. We bring you a story of one of the best investigators in the world. And this week, it's Sarah Chase. She is one extraordinarily courageous, gutsy person. Sarah Chase spent the 1990s covering that bloody and violent civil war in Algeria. Then she went to the conflict in Kosovo. And then she lived for years running a business in the worst place in Afghanistan, that hotspot of corruption, conflict, and drugs, Kandahar, the region where hundreds of NATO troops and thousands of Afghans died in a needless and stupid war prolonged by endemic official thievery. However, it was when Sarah Chase returned to America that she began to see how much her own society is steeped in corruption. She's the author of two superb, best-selling, and deeply personal books on corruption. They're The Thieves of State, Why Corruption Threatens Global Security, and just recently, On Corruption in America and What's at Stake. So in this episode, we spoke of her experiences in Afghanistan and how they compare to modern day America. Good morning, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's just get right into this because this is, I would argue, the most important question facing Western society now. But let's start with an intimate, personal political moment for you. You're staring at the screens of the debacle, the fiasco, the absolute nightmare in Afghanistan last summer. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? It's such a paradox because I knew it was going to happen. I knew a decade earlier it was going to happen. I told my boss at the time, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I'm done with Afghanistan because I knew that the decisions the United States government had made guaranteed this outcome. And yet, and yet, here's the paradox. It's like the death of a relative you know is coming. No amount of foreknowledge prepares you for the shock of the actual events. And it also abruptly thrust me into a life that I had left a decade earlier, because, of course, I got a lot of questions. I got a lot of media interviews and whatnot. And so suddenly I'm working Afghanistan around the clock again. But Sarah, I mean, first of all, I understand, sadly, all too well, that image of you prepare yourself for the death of a loved one. And my gosh, it doesn't matter how much mental, physical stuff, it's still going to hit you. What happened in 2011? There's an interagency decision made by America. What happened? What is that decision and what went on? The decision was explicitly not to address corruption as a part of the U.S. mission in Afghanistan. And I had really known almost for the previous eight or nine years, almost since I got there in the end of 2001, that corruption was going to determine the outcome of the mission. Because how can you ask a population to take risks in support of a government that's shaking them down? You know, I mean, that the logic of it was it just blew me away. And so I did basically everything I could, including eventually, you know, sort of climbing the ladder of who I was working for until I got to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is basically, you know, it's a cabinet member and he got it. You know, and that's part of why our partnership was so positive. 
And yet he's the guy in uniform and he's making an argument about a civilian issue, which is that if we don't address corruption, my forces can't pull this out of the hat. And what was so fascinating was at the time, the civilians were spending all their time in his business, you know, like the civilians in the cabinet meeting, meaning the national security advisor, the the secretary of state, the secretary of defense, the president. Right. And those all, guys decide that corruption isn't really that important of an issue. Well, first of all, they spend all their time talking about his business, which is how many troops should do what on the ground in Afghanistan. Right. And he's like, like, could you people work on your issues? And it was really his pressure that forced them to at least address corruption, which had not been done at a senior level until 2011, that is to say, almost 10 years after the war began. And the document that resulted explicitly stated that the U.S. government would only address street level corruption, in particular corruption perpetrated by the police, which conveniently was the military's responsibility. And you read that document, you're like, it's over. Yeah. Yep. I told Admiral Mullen that we were on our way actually to a battlefield circulation in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I sat next to him in the front of the cargo plane and said, look, boss, I'm done with Afghanistan because, because we're going to lose. You're going to lose. You're going to see the cancer has been declared. Somebody's going to die. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. That's right. Um, let me just rewind briefly, because you make a really courageous decision almost 10 years before. You know, you're award-winning national public radio uh, journalist. You've got this great life, at least in my head. You're living in Paris. You're jetting around the world, winning awards and stuff. But you decide, hey, I've had enough. I'm not going to do this. What was that? What was that moment that made you get off that life and start working in rural development in, in Kandahar? Two things. One is shut up already and do something. Meaning as a journalist, particularly as I had started living that life, you are making, you know, you're living on other people's drama without really being responsible for it. And so I wanted to take on some responsibility. Second is before I was a journalist, I was a historian and I have a sensitivity to historic moments. And I was sure that history was in the making right there. My understanding... That's Kabul, that's Afghanistan, the Taliban... Not Kabul so much as Kandahar, in fact, but yes, Afghanistan. And, that, and that's 2002 and the Taliban... Two, well, right. I mean, to me at the time, and I'm now not sure in retrospect that I was right, but at the time I felt as though 9-11 was the 21st century equivalent of the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand you know, in the 20th century, which sparked World War I, which is often seen as the actual beginning of the 20th century. And I thought that 9-11 was likely to be that kind of an epoch determining moment. But you would have thought, well, I'll go back to Washington, D.C. I'll stand right next to the epicenter of the beat of power. Instead, Sarah Chase says, OK, I'm going to go to this war torn country and I won't go to the capital. I'm going to go to this provincial town, which is the epicenter of the Pashtun culture and what eventually becomes the Taliban and the violence and all this stuff. Why do you choose to go there? I knew that Kandahar was the de facto capital of the prior Taliban regime. Number one. Number two, I had in covering other war torn places, I had seen that the bulk of the resources go to the capital and that that was usually a mistake. And so I wanted, so far as I could, to attract some resources to the very place that was least likely to get any. Boy, you were right. You spend the next few years building up a handicraft soap factory. Your book, Thieves Estate, starts with a pivotal moment where somebody is swearing. One of your workers is swearing because something has happened. Can you tell our listeners what that story was? He was a former police officer. His chief of police, who was a friend of mine, had been blown up in a remote IED. So this young man, very strong character, his brothers had been in the police too. And so once Zabit Akram, the chief, was dead, they all left the police. And one of them had opened a auto parts store. And so he was going back and forth to Pakistan, nearby Pakistan, to pick up parts that he would be selling. 
And on the way back from Pakistan, you get shaken down about half a dozen times at least by young police officers who stand in the middle of the road with their Kalashnikovs and stick out their hand. Shaking down, you mean effectively the police are mugging you? They're extorting bribes. Yeah. Mugging with the threat of violence rather than actual violence. And it's the cops that are doing it. Yes. It's not, it's not random tuggies, pashtuns, it's, whatever. It's they are. the police. And in this case, it's people's former colleagues. And by the time he reaches the gates to Kandahar, this brother was done. And so when he gets, again, importuned for money there, he says, no, I've had it. I've paid customs, which most people don't. I have paid your pals half a dozen times along the road. I'm finished. He gets slapped. Now, you're talking young Afghan male, proud, you know, a sense of dignity, doesn't. And a former police officer. And a former police officer. So he calls us, knowing that he calls his brother, but that's kind of us, knowing that we still have contacts higher up in the police department. And my cooperative member calls the chief of police to tell him this is going on. The chief of police says, well, he didn't die, did he? Wow. My cooperative member then said, by God, if tomorrow I see somebody laying an IED, and I see a police vehicle on its way toward that point in the road, I'm not going to say anything. When you ask why did Afghans tolerate the return of the Taliban, there's your answer right there. And, and again, to reinforce this for our listeners, the guys that you're hanging out with, many of them were former police. Exactly. And they're saying, we're not going to help our former colleagues. You know what? We're so angry at this moment. We will let them blow up. Can I tell you a quick story as a former journalist myself? And I really want to lay this in for both my students and our listeners, because Afghanistan repeatedly, same as Iraq, gets painted with this colonial racist paint of like, oh, well, corruption is their culture. And I just want to bridge into this because showing the challenges in Iraq. So I was there both before, during, and after the war, and I remember going to colleagues of mine in Kirkuk, which is like Kandahar, a provincial power center that doesn't get much resources. And I go to the local TV station, and the guys say, oh, you're a TV reporter, that's great. You know, you have problems in journalism there. Oh, yes, yes, I do. You know, it's very difficult being a Canadian journalist. Yes, we have problems here, too. Our colleagues just got blown to death in a suicide bombing. Don't you hate when that happens? And that's the challenge an Iraqi journalist is facing. You know, two weeks right. before their headquarters in the Kirkuk Broadcast Center, somebody had driven an enormous truck in and blown up half the newsroom. And I'm like, mate, I've got problems <laughs> in broadcasting, but it ain't that. It's not that. And I want to emphasize those stories to our listeners and my students because it ain't fair, this painting of Afghanis and Iraqis and the other people the non-Canadians, the non-Americans, is utterly inappropriate. Can you speak to that issue, please? Absolutely. I mean, I repeatedly get asked, isn't corruption just part of Afghan culture? And, you know, I want to I laugh in two ways. One is I have never had a single Afghan or a single Tunisian or a single Nigerian or a single Uzbek or a single, you know, I could go on, tell me, Sarah, would you get off your corruption jag? It's just part of our culture here. Stop imposing your Western norms. Nobody likes to be robbed by their government. It's just such a preposterous idea. And then secondly, and this you know, segues us, it sort of turns our attention almost 180 degrees back to us. I started applying for my most recent book on corruption in America, the very same framework for analyzing corruption in developing countries that I had worked out over the course of almost a decade, I applied that as dispassionately as I could to the United States. And I started with a court case that was decided in 2016 in the- uh, Donald case, the governor- That's right. Tell us that, because so, again, I didn't know that until I started reading your third book. And I'm like, what is this thing? So please lay that one out, the ball. Absolutely. So he was the governor of Virginia, 
he had been helped out not only in his campaign, but also personally with gifts, with loans of money, with all kinds of personal benefits by a kind of quack doctor guy who was trying to convert tobacco products into some pharmaceutical cure-all. And so, as we all now know in the post-COVID era, you need food and drug agency approval to market chemical compounds as medicine in this country. And so he was trying to get clinical trials, respectable clinical trials. So he wanted in return from the governor that University of Virginia Medical School run some trials. And the governor did everything he could to make that happen. He organized lunches, he leaned on subordinates, he called them up on the phone, et cetera, et cetera. McDonald was convicted of corruption in federal district court, the lowest level of the federal judicial system. That conviction was upheld on appeal. Both of those are unanimous decisions. And then the Supreme Court took it up. Not only did it overturn the ruling, it overturned it unanimously. Unanimously. The judge said, hang on, taking bribes to manipulate the system is not a good thing for the American political system. Correct. And not only that, and here's where we come back to the issue of culture, not only that, but when I was researching this for On Corruption in America, I interviewed Supreme Court lawyers, people who had argued cases, and even cases in this kind of trajectory of cases that I identified between 1987 and this 2016 case. So lawyers who had argued some of those cases, journalists who cover the Supreme Court. What did they say? What did they tell you? They basically all agreed that if McDonald's behavior was criminal, then essentially every politician in Washington is liable to prosecution. One of those lawyers says to you, the only people that could convicted are the bad ones. Right. And he didn't mean the bad ones morally. He meant the ones that are bad at corruption. They're not good at corruption. I want to emphasize this to our listeners. My poor students have endured me for a term saying corruption is the new norm in America. So that's the point. The point is who has a culture of corruption? I mean, that's what I had to come away from that investigation. That was the conclusion I came away with is, wait a second, Afghans are much more indignant in reaction to corruption, the corruption that they experience, than American elites are. Now, I do think that ordinary Americans are much more indignant than elite Americans, and that's typically the case. But I believe that That is part of the explanation for such a low voter turnout in this country. We only have 50% of the electorate actually votes. Yeah, I remember reading, you know, you're going in West Virginia, you're canvassing in West Virginia, and you're meeting working class people who are just constantly saying the same thing that working class people in Kandahar were saying. It's all about the money. Whoever politician gets paid, that's what they're going to do. Exactly. Let me just take a a brief psychological step aside. As a Canadian, I find it very Mm. difficult working in anti-corruption in Canada because Mm. the population, as well as the elite, is trained in a kind of cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. You can lead them to the stream. You can show them that somebody is doing a corrupt act. And they're like, oh, that looks like corruption, but it can't be corruption because we're Canadian. Right. The sort of Canadian exceptionalism and American exceptionalism. And even today, when the issue of political corruption is garnering much, much more attention, particularly what is coming to be called in kind of professional circles, strategic corruption, meaning the deliberate deploying of corruption as an instrument of state, particularly by quote unquote rogue countries like Russia or China. And so it's definitely risen in, you know, in prominence as an international issue. But what I find so fascinating is that when On Corruption in America came out, it was often paired in book reviews with a wonderful book called Kleptopia. Kleptopia is a wonderful, entertaining book about kleptocracy as perpetrated by those guys over there. 
by the usual suspects in places like Angola or Nigeria or Kazakhstan or Moscow. And, you know, there has been a push to show how Western institutions, quote unquote, enable the kleptocracy perpetrated by actors like ones in those countries, such as secrecy jurisdictions in places like the Cayman That's Islands. In America. That's what we have in Canada. Never... Right. And But what I want to actually say is we've gotten to the point where it is socially acceptable to, you know, criticize the quote unquote enablers. It is still not socially acceptable, as you point out, to notice the parallels between the way a government like Afghanistan's under Hamid Karzai right, and the way thing. the American or Canadian government operate. Like we're willing now, it's socially acceptable to say, oh, our banks and our real estate agents and our art dealers play these ugly enabling roles or in our lawyers, mm, right. but it's still not, as you point out, socially acceptable to say our system looks a lot like those systems because, of course, we're Canadian, we're American. We can't be like Nigeria. My producer, Caitlin, is waving a, a paper in front of me and she's saying, fine, Mr. Professor Declan and Ms. Professor Sarah, I want to know what is the corruption in America? What's the system? Are we dealing with kleptocracy here? Are we talking with a narco mafia? What is the system? And I ask you this because you're brilliant at outlining the different models of corrupt systems. So which, in your opinion, what best typifies modern day America? Well, here's what I would actually focus on is not so much the what side of your question as the system okay. side of your question. So let me just emphasize that a little bit more. Unfortunately, we have been schooled to understand corruption as a specific act, a one-to-one -one transaction. One-time bribe that thinks, that doesn't explain the opioid epidemic that has killed almost a million people. That's right. Country. And so what I am urging people to consider is corruption as the operating system of very sophisticated, if turbulent, dynamic networks, always informal networks. And those networks are vertically integrated. And by that, I mean, let's go back to your initial example of the police officer, right? right. When those guys were shaking down my cooperative member's brother, they were not keeping all the money they stole. They had to pay a portion of that money up the line. Now, at the time, the total amount of extorted bribes in the impoverished nation of Afghanistan amounted to between two and five billion dollars a year, according to two separate bribery surveys. So we're talking a massive revenue stream, right, which is making its way upwards in the hierarchy of these networks. What is given downwards in return is protection. And that's where you get things like, in the case of Afghanistan, President Karzai picking up the telephone and ordering the release of a suspect who, you know, was caught dead to rights, extorting yes. bribes, right? I remember this amazing story in Thieves of State where you're literally on the plane about to take off to go arrange the arrest of this guy and you get a call saying, hey, it's not, not going to happen. That's Afghanistan. And That's vertical integration. I don't see as much of that in the United States as I see the other type of integration, which is horizontal integration. And what I mean by that is that we in America often make very sharp distinctions between, for example, public and private sector, right? I mean, we can get into huge arguments all day long about who's worse for your health, right? Business or government. So what we have is an integrated network that includes members, uh, you know, business executives and top government officials, and very often out and out criminals, meaning drug traffickers, human traffickers, arms merchants, mafia types. Criminals are part of a network. They're one strand in a tripartite network that includes public officials, private, supposedly upstanding private enterprise executives right. or board members, whatever, and out and out criminals. We have an expression here, which is the revolving door. 
when an individual switches places, usually not from being an out and out criminal to being a public official. Right. But that's happened too. <laughs> but most often between business and criminality or business and government. But again, that expression is deceptive because it suggests this is one individual doing the switching. Whereas what I'm suggesting is that this is the operating system. This is the model. This is the operating system of the network. They're constantly shuffling their personnel around between diff among different types of positions that can afford the network as a whole the most benefit. And right. also so the individuals get the most personal benefit. The honest individuals get pushed out of the system. Correct. Raising their, their hand and saying, hang on a second. I don't want to see Enron. I don't want to see the savings and loan scandal. I don't want to see the Great Recession. I don't want to see the opioid epidemic. I don't want to see trillions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of people killed in these endless wars. So that's the fruit of this system that's being Exactly. Made. You're exactly right. It is a self-selecting system that rewards criminality and corruption and punishes virtue. That's the title of my first book, The Punishment yes. of Virtue. Sarah, let me take us right back to Afghanistan again. And if you could tell our listeners the story, because it, it ties in with this larger theme of systemic corruption. You are running now an artisan soap factory in Kandahar. You brought in a guy connected with the Karzai family to work with you. And you decide that you want to have lunch with the rest of the staff. Tell us about his reaction to that, what seems normal, and why that fits into that Mm. vertical integrated criminal mm. system that was going on in Afghanistan. That was not at the soap factory. It was at a prior incarnation. So it was when I first was there in 2002, and my first project was in fact rebuilding a village that had been destroyed in the American bombing using funds collected in a sort of sister city initiative by the town of Concord, Massachusetts, because we were thinking democracy back then, right? right? And, and it took me a couple of years to actually figure this out. It was the role of intermediary. So this individual wanted to play the role of intermediary between me and the population. And in so doing, he was able to commit many of the same types of corrupt actions that I later, that I came to understand is what exactly what was driving Afghans crazy. I was being tarred with it, of course, because to my neighbors, I seemed to be condoning this. And so in microcosm, so for example, he was stealing the money, he was not paying suppliers, he was right. leaving projects unfinished, he was probably committing pedophilia under my roof. I mean, you really have to stop and take a breath. I went in there with this kind of cultural relativism saying- and you had no idea what was going on. You just want to have a, a chat with the, the other stop. And he was like, no, I don't want you to talk to those guys. It's too dangerous. It's too this. It's too that. He didn't want me to get firsthand views of his behavior. I want to jump between that discussion over lunch hour and this guy wouldn't speak to you for two weeks to what happened when you tried to do the same thing with Stanley McChrystal and you walked into an office and said, you got to start talking to Afghans. I've got this group of elders who'd love to talk to you. And you were screamed at. This was in fact a CODEL. It was a congressional delegation. And it happened to be led by a family friend, Jane Harmon, who was at the time representative uh, from California. And so she had called me and said, could you set us something up? And the hoops we had to jump through, she was told by the U.S. Embassy, by the military down there in Kandahar, that this was too dangerous, that she shouldn't do it, to the point that Jane Harmon, who is a, she's an iron lady, she got rattled enough that she called me back and said, do you really think that this is okay? And I said, sure, it's okay. Then next I hear from the base, oh, the elders won't accept being put through screening, you know, the kind of metal detector. So I talked to the elders. They said, you can strip us naked if you want to. We want to speak to a U.S. congressional delegation. Just to have a conversation with them. Just exchange right. information. Right. And only because Jane trusted me enough 
that she insisted, did this thing happen? And other important thing that goes to your point is that I spoke top Pashto. So I was the translator and that gave both sides a degree of confidence because they both knew me personally. So they knew that I was not reporting anything they were saying kind of up the line, um, which is a tremendous problem that we have. The military command, its senior translator was a nephew and son-in-law of the chief justice of the Supreme Court who was a close Karzai ally. That meant that everyone who was talking to the commander of NATO on the ground, knew that everything they said was going to get to Karzai. So how was he ever going to get an actual spectrum of opinions and information? And so this was just fascinating in terms of how the U.S. government voluntarily narrowed the type of information and perspectives that it was taking in. What's the link there between that compartmentalization of information, the non-discussion of what's actually happening to working people? How does that affect America? Is the same thing happening here in America? Is Are working people's voices being silent on this corruption issue? Here's the parallel, and it takes us back to the case we discussed, McDonald versus the United States, the corruption right. case. And what the Supreme Court ruled was that it was part of an elected official's job to listen to constituents. But if you look at the case in point, this constituent invested nearly $200,000 in getting the ear of his governor. And so my question is, would I have gotten as an ordinary citizen of the state of Virginia, which I'm not, as much of the governor's time if I didn't have $200,000 to give him? Studies or polls of members of the U.S. Congress show that they spend approximately half of their time talking to donors. Fundraising, fundraising, fundraising. Fundraising half of their time. So then that means then let's set aside the time that they spend meeting with their colleagues, voting on bills, debating bills. How much of their professional time is left to meet with ordinary, unorganized constituents? Not much. This is a long process. In your third book, you talk about Christ cleaning out the temple at Jerusalem. From the depths of the dead, from the darkness of the 1330s, O oh, woe, O oh, shame, O oh, disgrace, O oh, infamy, O oh, infliction, O oh, ambition, O oh, struggle, O oh, compassion, O oh, outcry. And it goes on for lines, and then it ends, O oh, scandal to you, king. So hasn't corruption always been part of humanity? Let me draw an analogy. Violence is also part of humanity all okay. the way back. War is not a constant. It happens and then it stops happening. War is what? It is organized, massive, and condoned, at least by the elite, violence. So you can think of periods of massive, organized, and condoned by the elites corruption as something that occurs repeatedly, but not constantly, across human history. What I mean by that is we are living in a period right now of systemic corruption such as has not existed since the period from about 1870 until about, I'd say, 1935, 1940. So you had what was called the Gilded Age at the time. The Gilded Age makes it sound like it's some kind of golden light time. And really, it was a time of great exploitation. The corruption operated just as I'm describing it. I was shocked as I, as I dug into it for On Corruption in America at how closely it resembled the models that I had seen in places like Afghanistan or Honduras. Vertically and horizontally integrated networks of corruption had captured control, not just of the United States. And this is also what's really important and was very sobering to me. Every industrialized country, regardless not only of political party, but of political system, followed the same pattern. And what pulled us out of it? 
it's pretty scary. Two world wars, a Great Depression, and a pandemic that COVID is only now beginning to equal. And we're talking here two genocides and the use of the nuclear bomb. That is the stack of catastrophes it took to buy us approximately 40 years of Between a- 1945, re- end of the Second World War, and roughly 1980, the beginning of Reagan. Exactly. Let me bring it forward because there's a great story in The Intercept. I remember in September 2016, as Trump and Clinton are fighting. And they get the documents from WikiLeaks, which show that the head of the Obama transition team in 2008 has written to Citibank and said, who should be in our cabinet if, and we're fully expecting to win this election, if we win the election. And it comes back and there's 75 names and Intercept points out, well, of those 75 names, 72 of them actually got it. And the guy sending, who was head of Obama's transition was the son of the CEO of Citibank. That's the kind of stuff that we're seeing now. Expand, please. That's exactly what I mean by network. And when you're talking 71 people, you're not talking revolving door. You're talking an integrated network. Similar example, there was recently a fraud case for improper receipt of COVID relief funds by a phony, it was supposedly a child feeding center, and there were no child feeding sites, and I don't know, a hundred or so million dollars was siphoned out of COVID relief, and a lot of it sent to East Africa. And the Department of Justice has brought a case against these individuals with great fanfare. Meanwhile, six trillion public dollars were provided by the Federal Reserve to buy bonds from heavily indebted corporations as part of COVID relief. Now, these corporations were not heavily indebted because of COVID. They had run up their debts because of buybacks in order to artificially inflate the value of their shares, dividends, and high corporate compensation. They could pay off their investors, and then the public taxpayer was going to Bail them out, basically, with these bond buys. But it gets better. The Federal Reserve, so it's the New York Fed, which is responsible for executing these bond buys, but apparently doesn't have the in-house capacity to do that. So it puts out a contract to contract a private corporation to do this. But it's not the New York Fed that actually lets the contract. The New York Fed creates a private entity. Guess where the New York Fed creates that entity? In New York? Delaware. You got it. In the United States, number one secrecy jurisdiction. So now you have a private corporation, a limited liability corporation, which then offers a contract on a no bid basis with the largest money market firm on Wall Street, BlackRock. Then take a look at the personnel. So now we come back to your question about who should be in my cabinet. Take a look at the circulation of personnel between BlackRock, the Treasury, and the Fed over the past 10 or 20 years. It's this constant horizontal system. As part of the podcast, I really like to give my students, whose minds and imagination and curiosity are formulating, a chance to ask you questions. So, Caitlin, if you can come in and round the interview off, that would be brilliant. Thank you again for joining us today. It's been really awesome to speak with you. In your opinion, in this long battle against corruption, do you think we will ever overcome corruption or will this remain a constant conflict for us? I don't think we will entirely overcome corruption ever. The objective should be turning it back into something that is an aberration and has a high probability of being detected and punished. In other words, kept in control. Is there anything that we could do as everyday civilians to try to combat this type of corruption? Absolutely. And On Corruption in America actually concludes with a kind of grab bag. And I decided to make it a grab bag of things to do because different people are moved by different types of actions. And I think this problem is indeed 
the most important problem facing humanity in our generation because of the crises it spawns, ranging from violent extremism to climate change, right? Therefore, all of us are needed in the fight. But I would say two things. One is we've been told in the United States that money is speech. Let's speak with our money. Let's find out about the labor practices, the monopolizing practices of businesses before we spend our money on them. And if it costs a little bit more, or if it takes us a little bit further to purchase something that is produced in an ethical manner, let's make a party out of it. You know, let's go in a group and have some fun, you know? And that's one thing. The other thing that I think is at least as crucial. I'm actually kind of quoting my own father here. Let's hold our own communities up to their highest standards. Now that corruption has become a topic of conversation in the American political scene, that's great. But I don't, I see everyone pointing fingers at the other side. I see everyone saying, oh, corruption is terrible. And then the finger goes out and it's the other side responsible. I have found plenty of corruption on both sides of the aisle. So let's police our own. And that means our family. It means our community. It means our workplace. And it means our political party. It means our race. It means our gender. All of these identity divides. The problem is that the corrupt are really effective at agitating us against each other along identity divides. And what we tend to do is pardon the corruption within our own identity group, however we define it, and accusing other identity groups of their corruption. And we are gonna lose if we keep doing that. Would you say that there has ever been a moment during your battle with corruption that has made this all worthwhile for you? I mean, it's all been worthwhile in that I do think this is the most important fight to be in. But if you are asking me whether there have been any victories, not many, not many. And in fact, when I looked back at that late 19th and early 20th century parallel, I was frankly blown away by the power, by the persistence, by the dynamism, by the courage of, of the opposition movements at that time. And I don't feel like we're close right now. And so I have to say, I'm not sure, this is the second time I've said this in public, I'm not sure that we're going to stave off the calamities that the current degree of corruption has set in motion. So I think that what we're really in the business of doing right now is building a blueprint for the type of society that we want to emerge after this century's series of crises and practicing that type of society today, practicing it ourselves in our everyday lives. Never give up. Churchill's famous words. Not a great man in many respects, but never, ever, ever give up. Sarah, you have been so brilliant, Caitlin. Thank you so much. It's been really great speaking with you. Thank you both for this time that you've given us, and thank you for all your work, Sarah. Thanks to the entire team of students who are behind this podcast. Hey, everyone, it's Declan. On behalf of myself, Caitlin DeLuke, and the whole team, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I would also like to thank Sarah Chase both for joining us on the podcast and for her dedication to unveiling corruption around the world. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to us or like or promote us in some way on social media. It's super important. And we'll see you next week for another intriguing episode of Crime Ways. Thanks so much. We'll see you then.